Well, we are so excited for uh, this opportunity to speak with you. We've got where I'm at, uh, two sixth grade classes, and we've got okay. another class joining in, uh, Mrs. Isaacson class. Uh, and there might be a few other classes that join in from some other schools, just depending on timing and schedule. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, but as I shared with you, we've got about 25 classrooms joining in. So uh, that's why we'll be recording for those that can't make it live. They can go back and watch and, and connect that way. So we are really excited. We just looked into a little bit of the human landing system. Uh, we just, uh, in this space, just started our first prototype of idea just using pipe cleaner. So we're in the initial stages of stuff, but we still have a ton to learn. So I'm going to pass the okay. time your way, let you okay. know who you are, all that good stuff that you're working on. And uh, yeah, then lead to some Q&A uh, with all these awesome minds. Oh, sounds great, too. Let's all right, so it's all yours. All right. Let's see. Can everyone see my screen okay? Yeah. Okay, great. So let me go ahead and um put this in slideshow mode. Yeah, it's great to be here with everyone. I appreciate the opportunity from Mr. Aaron Mara for um, being able to present to NASA. I mean, present about NASA to you all in sixth grade. And I appreciate NASA for giving me this opportunity. I will be talking about my career overview and I'll be open to answer any questions you all may have. And Aaron told me to, about you all are learning about decision-making processes and how to think. And I probably have a couple of questions for you. And so this will be a sort of interactive um, presentation. See, so about me, I've been working at Marshall Space Flight Center located in Huntsville, Alabama, for about 13 years now. Um, year 14 will be in on January 20th. I started my career as a co-op student, which co-op is short for cooperative education. It's where you work a semester on site and then you go to school a semester and you keep alternating for several semesters until graduation. When I first started, I was in the mission ops lab where my responsibilities were to incorporate a mission timeline for the constellation era. And I would just see what time should events occur, what should occur before it and after it, and come up with a short description. Then I worked in the propulsion detail design group, which is an engines group. I learned how to do CAD work or computer aided drafting and I was um, creating different designs for the engines, maybe a, so in, in brackets and other hardware that was needed for the engine that would eventually take us to the moon and to Mars. Then I've done some details and or rotations to friction stir welding. And that's where we learn a new welding process. That's well, it's about thirty years old now, and. Um, I've also did structural analysis, which you see a little bit of that on the screen in the background, where we determine how much load or how much stress an object can take before it starts to break or before it even has little small cracks or showing signs of breakage. Then I began an interest in um, systems engineering, where I was interested in how all the components fit together and make one rocket. So uh, that's how I got interested in the system definition and integration branch. I stayed there for about two years. And about two and a half years ago, I received a promotion and opportunity to be the risk reduction integration lead and a technical manager for the human landing system, and which will land the first woman and person of color on the moon, hopefully by the end of this decade. So this next slide shows the Statue of Liberty, which is in New York, and it shows the shuttle, which is right next to it, and our two rockets, which are in the middle here, and the Apollo, or Saturn V. It shows a height comparison. As you all can see, um, the Orion, or Block 1, this one in the middle is the one that was uh, attempted launch in late August, early September, but due to technical issues and then the issue with the hurricane, we had to roll it back into the vehicle assembly building 
and this is in Cape Canaveral, Florida. And hopefully we'll try to launch again in um, probably the middle to late November. The one next to it is the bigger rocket that will, that's the one that's going to the moon. The one before it is a test launch. It'll be circling the moon and, and um, in the earth and releasing several payloads or objects that are into space for science experiments. So this is just a comparison chart for height. This next one is what we were working on in the um, HLS or human landing system. We had three teams to compete for a contract. And um, the one on the left was spearheaded by Blue Origin, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, and Draper Labs. The one in the middle is Dynetics, which is local to Huntsville, Alabama. And the one on the left is also um, was local to Kent, Washington. And the one on the right is SpaceX. And that one was from Hawthorne, California. All three of those competed for a contract starting in April of 2020, all the way until about um, April or May of 2021. And can anyone probably guess which one won? Maybe you watched the news or you probably know. I, I see a hand raised. Um, can, can you share it with us? Oh, go ahead. Um, I need dynamics. You think Dynetics won? Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Anybody else want to take a guess? I see another hand in the back. There. SpaceX. 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 Yeah. Okay. We'll see um, here. Well, before I answer you all's question and tell you all who won, um, we had to we had to weigh the, these different options. All of them were great landers, great choices, but we also have to decide how should we make a selection on who will have the best lander that we will need. So we looked at management techniques, like how did the managers manage their task and did they complete the, their task on time? Did they let us know if they had any issues in a timely manner and so forth? But then with their technical approach, which is the ins and outs of how they they want to land their, how do you want to create and land their lander on the moon? And of course, the overall cost. So, um, what do you all? What are your contributing factors that could impact your decisions? Let's see. Um, what What are some things that you all would have to consider to make a decision? Does anyone want to, to try to take a stab at it? Like different things that you would think of. So, think about the work we've been doing. You guys have been trying to develop your own prototypes to your to the problems that you've developed thinking about this rocket, what are other things that you would have to think about when you guys have gone through this thinking process? What would be some things? She's listed some here. What would be some additional ones? About your own criteria. Chef, okay, I see a hand up. Um, weight. That's definitely very important, especially when you're going into space or even if you're going to be on Earth or just on an airplane. Weight is definitely important in the flight world. That's definitely something we have to consider. See so, uh, some more hands up. Let's see, I see um, one from Miss Isaacson's class. Who I would take into account what resources the company has? Like, do they have the employees? Do they have like the things we need to build? The things we need, stuff like that. Great. Yes, definitely. Resources is also a great one. See, see another hand up? <laughs> You'd have to know their strengths and weaknesses so you could like evaluate how good they'd be. Great. Definitely. That's what we definitely had to consider those too. Like who was good at which area? Lawrence. I'll, I'll take one more. Lauren? Said uh, management of the company overall. Oh, yes, definitely. We definitely looked at that, too, as part of our management techniques, too. We looked at our management of the company. We had to look at resources. We had to look at the interests, the, re the requirements, or do they really want to go, and who all just who all proposed. And what is their schedule, their duration, how much is everything going to cost? I mean, some 
some people have a lander that may not cost as much, but the technical is uh, kind of out of sync. Then you have some that is expensive, but their technical is correct. And then you have to tell to look at the management overall. So it's many factors that goes into selecting a contractor. So those of you all who get SpaceX, you won. Congratulations for those of y'all who thought that. Um, some of you all probably watched the news. This is Starship, and we have awarded them to develop a contract. So they will be um, the initial lander phase. Right now, we have another competition going on for the sustaining lander, and that is open to all industries except for SpaceX since they won the initial contract. And this is to take us back to the moon, and this is their this image here is Starship, and this is what they are using, and we are currently working on the technical aspects of that and planning that mission as we speak. So um, what does it take to plan a mission? I started off with just the planning, maybe in a simple form, we planned and we experiment. Then of course we have to go through all the processes and everything, and then we'll go. So, so uh, mission enablers, does anybody have some things that they would like to talk about as far as planning or experimenting? We have to think about the resources, as someone mentioned earlier, the purpose of the mission, where are we going, when do we need to go by? And since this is, we have to do a lot of experimenting on Earth, like the different products, how does food, exercise, and so forth work in space, water. And then I put a, on here a couple of disciplinary teams that we have, which is structures, avionics, flight ops, ground ops, guidance, navigation, and control, our engines, or propulsion. We have our safety crew. We even just have people who just deal with astronauts only. And of course, we have to have risk, which are anything that can go wrong. We want to prevent those in advance. So does anybody have any other contributions that you have to think about when you're planning or trying to go into space or a mission? It's definitely a huge job. Well, Leslie, maybe a question, a question I have while they're thinking of maybe some answers. So as you're, as NASA and all these teams, I know there's lots of people that are involved in all this, we're looking at that experiment phase. And a mm -hmm. lot of these classes are in this idea of starting to build out their ideas, continue to test ideas and add to that without getting too crazy and all the technical, how, do, how does NASA go about doing that in terms of experimenting and testing ideas? Are they going in and changing a bunch of things all at once? Are they looking at maybe changing one thing at a time? Like in just in, in general, some of that experiment process as a lot of these classes are gonna to start to dive into trying out an idea, seeing what works and what doesn't and going back and refining. Um, any tips with that in terms of just experimenting in general that might be helpful? And then I think we can then maybe that'll trigger some thoughts on what else they should uh, consider. Okay, I would say at first, we tried to go by heritage or history of the hardware, see what may have occurred during the Apollo era or shuttle era. We do recycle some components from there. I think we tried to do that first. And but of course, those were all 20th century. So you're looking at the 60s, 70s, and then with the shuttle era, the um, 80s, 90s, and even the early 2000s. So we have to upgrade our technology to match the 2020s. So um, I think we do test maybe one thing at a time. Whenever we're testing anything scientific, it's always important to only change one variable at a time. Because if you change several barriers, I mean several, several barriers, or I mean several vari variables, then you know you don't know what went wrong, what goes and what went well. So yeah, just doing it once at a time, that's one way how we do it without getting no like really, really technical with it. But yeah, we do go by the heritage first. So we thankfully, we're just so grateful for the astronauts and other scientists before us who um, left documentation and of course the hardware. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. So then maybe we can come back to her original question for any students in any class if we're thinking about what else might need to be considered. So 
We've talked and she's talked about planning. So this experimenting, she's given some different discipline teams. What else would have to be considered in order to go to, to leave earth and, and go do these missions? Okay, I see, I see one hand, Aaron, in, in your room. Yeah, go ahead. Um, everything on the shuttle needs to have a purpose. That is definitely true. We have no component or any software that's just there, just to be there. Every component has a purpose, has a function, has something that it's supposed to do. That's exactly correct. Anyone else want to share before I move on to the next slide? Okay, if not, I'll go on to, this is the moon and Mars exploration slide. We talk about the lunar terrain vehicle, the human landing system, which is on the left. And we're just comparing moon to Mars. The reason why we are going to the moon at first is because it is closer to earth and Mars will be next because it's a lot further away and will take several months to get there, um, maybe about six months. That's how long it took the last rover to um, arrive, uh, Perseverance. When it launched last year, I think it would took it all the way until February of this year in order for it to, um, I mean, of last year to, uh, to arrive at Mars. So um, we have to think of things like cruise size, the mobile expedition duration, um, the surface power, you got to think of the energy because everything you take from Earth, that's what that's all you're going to have on the moon or on Mars. I mean, like you only can have so much fuel, so much energy or power. There's nowhere to just get that in space. Like when you're on Earth, when you're on a road trip, there's several gas stations, there's restaurants on the way, there's hotels. Over here, we have to create all of that on the moon. So we have to have somewhere to live, somewhere, some way to have fuel and energy or power. We have to bring our own food because we haven't proven yet whether or not we can grow anything on the moon or on Mars. And hopefully if the moon trip is successful, we can land the first humans on Mars in the 2030s or 40s, depending on how everything goes. So yes, quite a few um, things that we have to look at in the moon to Mars comparison. And let's see, these are all the social media handles. We're on every social media site, so feel free to follow us it, at NASA. And let's see, I had one video. I'm not sure if you can hear the sound or not, but um, I'll play this for about two or three minutes. Three, two, one, zero. Lift off. Artemis 1 will lift off from launch pad 39B at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida with 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust provided by the most powerful rocket in the world, our Space Launch System rocket, or SLS. The uncrewed flight will be the first integrated test of SLS, our new Orion spacecraft and exploration ground systems at Kennedy. Artemis 1 will send Orion beyond the moon, 280,000 miles from Earth, farther than any human spacecraft has ever flown. This is not NASA doing this. This is the United States of America doing this, this program, the Artemis program. And there are companies all across our country that have a part in it. So there is kind of this wave of excitement being generated just by saying, we're going back to the moon. After the upper stage of the rocket separates from Orion, the upper stage will deploy small satellites over several days to perform science experiments and technology demonstrations. Orion will make its multi-day outbound trip to the moon propelled by a service module provided by the European Space Agency. Engineers will test Orion's systems on the way to the moon. Then Orion will fly about 60 miles above the lunar surface using the moon's gravity and engines on the service module to enter a lunar orbit. After about a month and a total distance of over a million miles, Orion will return home faster and hotter than any spacecraft has before.
A primary goal of Artemis 1, ensure Orion safely returns to Earth before we fly with humans. When we do, we'll build our capability for sustainable lunar exploration, preparing us for missions farther into the solar system. Initially, what we'd like to do is start establishing a presence on the moon. So we're going to establish going back there on a regular basis, and then we'll end up setting up Gateway, and we would launch to the Gateway, and from Gateway, land on the surface of the moon. We are there for, you know, weeks, months on end. And there, we're going to be able to test out all the hardware and the habitats and the hatches and the suits and the rovers that will allow us to prove out those technologies. The moon will lead the way to Mars, and we should be there within the next couple of decades. All right, so, um, so that was the end of that video. And um, so I hope you all enjoyed that. And I'll, of course, I'll be happy to answer any questions. And I just want to present a little bit about what we currently live in this International Space Station. You heard a little bit about Gateway in that video. Gateway is the new space station that is going to be orbiting the moon. The one that we have now orbits the Earth, and it's about the size of a football field. Um, of course, it's larger than a six-bedroom house, so it is the size of a mansion, even though you may or may not can tell because of the solar panels and all the other nodes. And it's definitely a pretty heavy hardware, and it took several years to construct. And I had a short video about life inside the ISS in case anyone's interested and may have not known how astronauts are living in the um, ISS or International Space Station. So this is node two. This is where four out of six of us sleep. You can follow me if you want. It's sort of like a little phone booth. I've got a sleeping bag. The sleep station is also like a little office. We've got a computer in here, a couple little toys. I've got some books. All right, come on back. There's more to show you. We have some exercise equipment on board the space station. The bike, a treadmill, and a weightlifting machine. You don't need a seat because you don't sit down. Actually, I haven't sat down for six months now. All right, a little farther on. Come on. This is our kitchen. There's all sorts of foods here. Meats, eggs, vegetables, snacks. And that's a good place. That's where you find all the candy. my two buddies uh, in the airlock. The spacesuit is pretty big, as you can see. It's like being a football player. It's usually pretty sunny out there, so we have to wear our sunglasses, and this is our sunglasses right here, which make you look pretty cool. Here we are at the throne, and of course, it serves for two functions. Number two, right here, and this guy right here, is for number one. It's color-coded, so you really don't get it mixed up. What kind of toilet paper do you have? Russian wipes. We have some nice tissues. And then if things get really out of control, we have uh, disinfectant wipes. Now I'm going to take you to one of the coolest places on the space station. It's like a glass bottom boat. It's one of those places you find yourself hanging out in all the time because all you want to do is look back at our planet. That's the spacecraft that's taken us home to planet Earth today. Oh my gosh. Like Superman. Woo! <laughs> See, all right, that's all of my presentation today. Um, you all have any questions that you all would like answered? I hope you all enjoyed the videos and the presentation. Uh, please let me know. Yeah, so that was great. Let's do, uh, I'm sure we've got lots of questions. So we can just kind of navigate between 
the different rooms that we have. We'll just stick to the same protocols. Just have a student come up to the screen. That way we can kind of signal that makes your life a little bit easier um, as we come mm -hmm. here. So. Anybody here have any questions you would like to ask Leslie or other classes too? Oh, we got one right there. There we go. Hey. Okay. Let's see, I'm sure. Go ahead. I think someone from Miss Isaac's class. Um, I was wondering as a student, how could we experiment on like heat and energy? Wow, that's a pretty good question. Um I'm not sure exactly how to experiment on heat and energy, but I'm sure there's a couple of experiments, you know, that you can research online for those. That's those are definitely need to be experimented so as far as prior to going into space. Um, there's lots of experiments out there um, only because I'm not a, a subject matter expert in those. So I you know, can't really tell you off the top of my head, but I know, know there, are, there are some for the sixth grade level. Too. Yeah, and I know NASA.gov has lots of um, ways that you all can do different experiments with heat, energy, and anything else, any other discipline. Yeah, why don't you come on up to the okay. question come up by the end. What is like the soil or like the quality of the land on the moon for like growing and stuff? Let's see, um, we're still experimenting with the growth of plants or any uh, food on the moon, but I think they have found, they have returned, you know, a couple of soil and rock samples back to the earth. I want to say it's similar to the brown dust or or soil that you see on the earth. It's just more so grayish white colored. And there are some rocks on the moon too as well. So far, they just seem similar though, but we do have geologists and other scientists who are comparing um, the rocks and soil on the moon to the ones that's on earth. And also what um, one of the rovers may have brought back from Mars, some of their samples. And they also are preparing for a Mars sample return mission. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, what do you use for your heat shield? I think, we, I think we use mostly foam for the heat shield. I know that that was the, one of the issues they had in a previous shuttle um, incident. But I'm thinking foam is and more so aluminum is probably more so what they're using for the heat shield. Um. How does NASA know like which astronauts have like food restrictions or allergies to like objects like penicillin I mean, or something? Um, see, I think once they select the astronauts, then they'll probably have them to fill out a questionnaire asking about their food allergies or anything else that they need to know, like a met or talking about a medical condition. I'm sure it's not on the general application because they get so many astronaut applications. I mean, over 10,000 people apply for each time it opens. So um, yeah, they definitely probably fill out a questionnaire and they have a manager or someone they have to report to, to let them know about the food allergies that they have or any other restrictions. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Is, is there like um, any, actual soil inside of the moon like or is it just like the moon mm -hmm. see is there like the soil like on like the inside of the surface yeah. of the moon and not just yeah. on the surface that we see we're not for sure just yet i'm not sure if they like done some research like they did for the earth where you have the different stages of it if i can remember correctly i think the core and the mantle and all the different stages of when you dig into the earth. I'm not sure if that one has been discovered just yet on the moon. They're still trying to scratch the surface or, but I'm sure they are, they will be testing for that to see what's under the main surface of the moon and see if we can dig. Thank you. Don't find anything. Thank you. Um, so when could you see astronauts or people? 
living on Mars? Like, in how many years could you see people living on Mars? See, I could probably see it at least 15 years or so from now, maybe a little less. Um, definitely by the time you all um, complete college. So it's definitely a possibility. Of course, the moon has to be successful first. And I know that we can't, it's not possible to have life on all of Mars, but there is a small portion of Mars that can support human life. And we're hoping 2035 to 2040 that we should be able to land humans on, on the Martian surface. Leslie, a lot of these uh, students and these groups are starting to figure out how to construct their ideas. And I know you've got some experience in design and, and welding and CAD and different things like that. And we may not get obviously that technical, but in terms of like structure and maybe even thinking about in their brain, what their real kind of build might be, what are maybe some things that we should be thinking about um, outside of just some basics in terms of like what we have for materials and we want it to be strong or this or that, that as, as we're looking at how to bring our ideas to life that these kids should be thinking about in, in, in terms of their design, their prototyping, and maybe just some construction in, in general. Um, see for in this um, space flight or even just aeronautics, definitely yeah. strength and weight is, are the two most important things that you want to keep in mind when designing anything structurally. Also, we try to stay away from heavy materials such as steel as much as possible. Instead, we'll try to make everything out of aluminum if it has to be metal. Um, we've even tried titanium, but um, the, the problem with it is just the cost of it is increased. So that's also another thing you have to look at is the cost. But we also are trying to experiment with additive manufacturing or 3D printing, where we make things out of various types of plastic or some sort of clay to put together. We even use ceramics. That's also some materials that we think about. So those are some of the materials that NASA uses to create some of their um, structures and, and other hardware. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so me and my group are trying to make a dome that has lights and sound in it. Would it be mm -hmm. possible, um, like the design choices, would it be possible to install other things that you, you know, bring from home to put up there kind of? Um. I think it depends on the size of your dome. If it's like really, really small, you probably could put some LED lights on it or something from home. You probably could decorate it a little bit. But if it's something that's supposed to fly, you definitely have to keep your mass or your weight in mind. Know that the more materials that you put on it from home, then, you know, it may or may not be able to fly, but NASA does definitely do a lot of domes as far as their oxygen and hydrogen tanks. And those are some things they have to think about too, even though we don't bring anything from home, but we have like different machines that construct it layer by layer. Can we ask a question? Sure. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I wanna make sure you guys had your voices heard. I couldn't tell if they were ready or not. Yep. You can ask the digging question. Um, I, I actually have a question as we're sitting here talking about, my group has talked a lot about digging below the surface of both possibly the moon and Mars, as far as, um, you know, like looking at living mm -hmm. under the surface. But as you were talking, I it, the thought occurred to me that digging requires some pretty heavy duty equipment. Right. Which um, would be nearly impossible to get there just due to weight. So, um, are there any? Uh, I don't. What would you? What What are your thoughts about like what kind of materials might be used to dig into the surface of the Moon or Mars? Right, because currently on Earth we use um, we actually will use you know some sort of steel to do any digging on Earth. We definitely have to use metal um, materials. But for the moon and Mars, I think that it's possible. I know there were some college groups that were looking at digging into the Mars or the 
moon surface looking for maybe ice or rocks or water or water in its liquid form. But um, I think that we would probably, we could take that to space probably, but we just have to get like a huge rocket for it. And it'll probably have to be a cargo only um, vehicle. We can't, we can't do that and humans so far for what we know. Um, either NASA would or one of the contractors would probably create a rocket that would be big enough to have some heavy duty equipment too. And it, which is one of the reasons why we're doing materials engineering to figure out which materials are lightweight and strong at the same time that we could use to dig underneath the moon or the Mars surface. Is it possible that there could be some sort of explosive that would work? Um, that's a possibility too. I haven't really thought much about that because I'm just thinking manually digging. But that's a possibility to we just have to figure out the the right area to have that and because you know we have to get around craters and other surfaces too sure so that, that could be a, a good way to do it do you want to ask a question we have one other question sure um also back a bit earlier about the heat shield the foam that you guys use for the heat shield what is it like is it like soft is it like thick and hard or um I'm not sure of the exact name of it, but I do know that it is pretty thick, pretty hard, though. And it's, it's probably the same foam that they've used on the external tank of the space shuttle, which is the large orange tank underneath it. So yeah, that's the typical foam that we use. It, it is pretty thick, like maybe several inches thick. What do you guys currently do to entertain astronauts? Okay, great question, too. Um, what do we typically do to entertain the astronauts? I know it seems like when they go into space, they're all alone, and it's like, what do you do whenever you're not doing any experiments or if, when you're not on the phone talking with family? They do have ways to communicate, of course, back to Earth. It just takes a while. So uh, I think some of the astronauts may sing. They may talk with other astronauts from other countries. I mean, we do have some from Russia and Japan and um, Italy and any other place in Europe. I do think there's some from Spain and France that are also up there. So they'll probably talk and collaborate with them sometimes. I've even heard of um, someone, I'm not sure which astronaut um, brought a saxophone and was playing it into space. Uh, so I thought that was pretty cool. But yeah, they definitely have some entertainment in space. So my question was, what do you guys use during the duration between the moon and then Earth? Like what type of energy do you use? Like do you use rocket fuel or like what type of energy would you use for that? Um, between the Earth and the space station, when we launch off the ground, we use the rocket fuel itself until the boosters depart. But the reason why we're going at such fast speeds and using that fuel is because we had to try to escape the Earth's, gra um, the Earth's gravity and move into further into space. So what we do, and each after so many minutes or so many hours, another component of the rocket may fall off. That's part of the fuel too, and it contains um, both hydrogen and nitrogen. And then there's some that contain oxygen too. So we use, use those fuels, okay? The rocket, they comes apart in the certain areas, but once we get out of the Earth's atmosphere into like the lower orbit towards the space station, we pretty much just rely on like small engines. So we'll use that fuel. We also have, um, those solar panels, so we'll use some energy from the sun. So that's how we pretty much get from Earth into the space station. Uh, so uh, do you have something to take care of space junk up there and like melt the space junk and like turn it into like metal and things that can be reused or no oh, or plants wow. for, it for the moon that's a pretty good question um when it comes to space junk if it can we'll try to um i guess some of it they just let float off into space and it just floats wherever it goes but there are some that they probably could reuse 
like water is never junk. I mean, they do have a way to recycle sweat and urine into drinkable and bathing water. But like things like trash, like um, their plastic bags or something from the food items, I think those, they may just let float off into space. And sometimes we'll have another cargo unit that will launch. They don't really talk about those or public size them. And they would bring them new supplies. And sometimes they may take some trash with it. It just depends on the material if it's biodegradable or not. Um, how, do, how do we communicate from the space station? Like, do we use like radio waves? Like, how do we do it? See, I would say, yeah, we do use radio waves. Um, communication is definitely something that we have people who are experts at that try to figure out how we can communicate from Earth to the space station. I heard, I heard um, years ago when they first went to the moon, it took probably over 20 or 30 minutes for the communication to reach from Earth to the moon with the, in the 60s because we didn't have much technology. Um, and so today we have more technology in our computers or even in our cell phones than they did back in those days. So it's like they land on the moon and then next thing you know, 20 or 30 minutes later, they had to just wait for a while before the signal would go back to Earth. But yes, they definitely use radio waves though. And of course we use computers, and because of space, we that's how we have Zoom and all these other um, and Teams and all these other wireless communications. But Thank of course, you. today it's a lot much quicker <laughs> to um, communicate. Thank you. <laughs> well, Leslie, this has been been awesome. We we can't thank you enough for your time to lend your expertise and, and share about your work and your journey and, and some of this information as we continue. Thank you keep going back to the drawing board and learning more about our problems and the solutions we want to create. So uh, this has been, been really helpful and um, really thankful for you to uh, carve out some time out of your day. I know that you're a, a busy person, so we all appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Aaron. Thanks everyone. I appreciate talking with you all. It's been a pleasure and I hope you all enjoyed the presentation and feel free to reach out if you have any more questions and I'll definitely try to find those answers for you all. Perfect. We'll appreciate that. I'm sure we'll, we'll take you up on that honor. All right. Thank you. All right. You all have a great day. Bye. Bye.